Λοιπόν, ξεκινάμε το δεύτερο session, το οποίο έτσι έχει μια εσωτερική συνάφεια με το προηγούμενο, γιατί όπως επενήχθηκα στην αρχή, τα φορτία των, το, του shipping είναι το, σε πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό το καύσιμο των υπολείπων. Δηλαδή μεταφέρουμε LNG, μεταφέρουμε πετρέλα, μεταφέρουμε κάρβονο, μεταφέρουμε ενδεχομένω uh, grains τα οποία μπορεί να μετατραπούν ή να αντικαταστήσουν biofuels. Ε, σε μεγάλο βαθμό λοιπόν το καύσιμο του μέλλοντο έχει σχέση και με το φορτίο του μέλλοντο. Πολλό μάλλον που. Στην πραγματικότητα, το πλοίο, όταν καίει κάτι, δεν καίει κάτι που είναι ειδικά για τα πλοία. Καίει στο heavy fuel oil, ακόμα και στο low sulfur fuel oil, και τα κατάλοιπα των καυσίμων όλης της υπόλοιπης οικονομίας. Κάτι αντίστοιχο θα συμβεί και στο, στο fuel transition, στην μεταφορά των πλοίων από την καύση πετρελαίου στην καύση κάποιου άλλου προϊόντος. Και αυτό το προϊόν, θα είναι ένα καύσιμο για όλη την οικονομία και επομένως θα χρειάζεται να μεταφέρεται. Άρα αυτά τα δύο θέματα νομίζω ότι είναι πάρα πολύ αλληλένδετα. Παρ' όλα αυτά εμείς εδώ στην Αυτιλία θα πρέπει, όπως έλεγε και ο κύριος Λασκαρίδης στο προηγούμενο, στο προ προηγούμενο session, κάτι πρέπει να αποφασίσουμε. Έτσι. Τα πλοία, τα σημερινά, κάποια στιγμή θα γίνουν obsolete, κάποια στιγμή θα χρειαστεί να γίνει το transition και θα πρέπει να βρεθεί κάποιο επόμενο καύσιμο. Αυτό το θέμα, λοιπόν, το πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Θα το συζητήσει τώρα με την, το session αυτό, με την προεδρία του κυρίου Γιώργου Καραγεωργίου, ο οποίος είναι, ε, όχι κατά σύμπτωση, ο πρόεδρος και CEO της Olympic Shipping and Management, ο οποίος είναι και αυτός ε, ε, απόφυτος του CAS, έτσι. Το 87. Το, το 87, πρώην νυν μπέις, βέβαια, τότε CAS, το 87-88. Οπότε, ε, George, you have the floor. Καλησπέρα σας. Χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ που βρίσκομαι σήμερα μαζί σας για να συζητήσουμε ε, τα, καύσιμα, τα μελλοντικά καύσιμα της ναυτιλίας. Um, the presentation will be in English. Uh, we, present, we, we prepared all the presentations in English and I think it will be better if we continue and present in English. And uh, I would like to uh, start uh, with, with a very brief overview of how this session uh, will go. Um, uh, as everybody knows, uh, the new IMO regulations involving EEXI and CII become effective on January 2023. And for the next five to 10 years, uh, ship owners will have various options in order to comply with the regulations. They can limit the maximum and operational speeds of their vessels. Uh, they can use technical upgrades in order to improve their propulsion efficiency and also reduce the hull's resistance. And they can also retrofit their vessels with additional sources of power. A bit later on, towards the end of the decade, they can also start mixing conventional fossil fuels with um, gray or, or, or green fossil fuels in order to reduce even further uh, the emission uh, output and therefore prolong the life of their vessels. In the long run though, they will eventually exhaust all these possibilities and thus they will have to start using alternative low or zero carbon fuels. Today, we have selected to talk about the four most commonly discussed uh, future fuels and these are LNG, hydrogen, methanol and ammonia. We will start the session with four presentations, each one lasting 10 minutes, and then um, we will leave the remaining eight, nine minutes at the end in order to address any questions that you might have and also form a little bit of a dialogue if there is a need. The purpose of this session uh, is not to tell you which one of these four alternative fuels will prevail in the future, but to highlight the main characteristics of each one name the strong, uh, the, the strong points and drawbacks of each of the fuels, and also talk about the technology that exists today in order to produce it and in order to consume it. I strongly believe that in the future, 
we will have several different fuel options and the selection of the preferred solution will depend on the ship type, the trading pattern of the ship and the availability of the fuel at the various different ports that lie alongside the ship's trading routes. Now, without any further delay, let's start the presentations and uh, I call upon Leonidas Caristios to talk to us about LNG. Leonidas Caristios joined Royals Registered in 1998 and he worked abroad in, and he was involved in uh, major new building projects for the beginning of his career. He joined DNV in 2017 and he is currently the Regional Business Manager development manager and gas segment director for Southeast Europe, Middle East and Africa. Leonida, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here in front of you. Um, in the next uh, minutes, I will try to give you the story of LNG. So basically, we will uh, need to realize an alternative fuel uh, through four aspects. Uh, what is the technology? Where it stands with environmental compliance? Uh, we will try to discuss about the commercial uh, impacts and have an overall view of uh, the supply. I want, uh, however, to highlight that the LNG maritime, sorry, thank you. The, the LNG maritime is not very new. Actually, it started in the 60s when the first shipments of natural gas in liquid, liquefied form was transported by sea and the cargo was used to fuel and propel those vessels. Obviously, since then, a lot of technological developments have been made. So what kind of technology we are talking about in LNG fuel vessels? Basically, we need a tank. Uh, to store the LNG on board, we need uh, this uh, gas to go through a fuel gas system to the main energy consumers. This is obviously the main engine to propel the vessel, auxiliary engines and boilers for the power demand. One element of LNG is that all this experience over the last decades has been transferred uh, to the maritime industry and we have regulations, standards and requirements which are quite prescriptive that enables the safe and reliable application on board general cargo vessels. So the key takeaways when it comes to the technology available for LNG fuel vessels is that it's not new because it started from gas carriers and all the developments that have made up to this stage are around the standard uh, established technologies on board, which is basically the internal combustion engines. Now, let's look at the LNG, where it stands in terms of um, the environmental landscape. Everybody's talking today about uh, CO2 emissions. Before I go there, I would like to uh, present uh, the benefits of LNG when it's used for other um, um, let's say pollutants like SOx, NOx and particular matter emissions where you can see the benefit is quite significant. Now for understanding what will be the benefit of using LNG in terms of CO2, considering the well-to-wake approach, um, even the methane sleep, depending on the technologies, we can achieve a combined effect of 20%. Now, what does it mean 20% in terms of IMO compliance for the years to come? If we compare two, let's say, VLCCs, uh, one with conventional fuel and the other one with LNG fuel, the one with LNG will have a compliance period of another 12 years. And if it reaches to a point that it needs to do further, then uh, the use of biogas, green forms of LNG, at a percentage of 5 to 10 percent probably needs to be applied. Now the commercial business case is quite complicated. For a new building, based on what we know, is about 10 to 15 million US dollars extra investment, which is quite a lot. In case of retrofits, it's even higher. The payback time used to be quite attractive because LNG was comparatively low priced versus other types of fuel, even alternative ones. 
However, late in 2021 and 2022, we saw a significant increase on the price. That makes the return on investment take longer. And we have certain uncertainties about how the CO2 tax scheme will actually end up being. Lastly, I want to talk about the LNG bunkering infrastructure, which has developed over the years. You can see that there is um, a quite good coverage of major ports, which normally vessels call for bunkering operations. More are coming online. And a little bit, a, a word on the LNG fuel vessels. Actually, in 2019, we had over 300 LNG fuel ships. Three years later, in today, we have an increase with more than 700 vessels confirmed using LNG as fuel, and in addition to that, more than 200 vessels as LNG ready. So, ladies and gentlemen, in order to conclude my presentation, we have covered the technology, where it is now, how it's developing, what is the benefits or not of using LNG in terms of the environmental compliance, and of course we address certain uncertainties, specifically on the commercial business case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonida, for a very interesting and concise presentation. We now move on to Dr. John Kokarakis, who is the Technology Business Development Director for Southeast Europe, Black Sea and the Adriatic Zone of Bureau Veritas's Marine and Offshore Division. Thank you, Mr. Kar Thank you, Mr. Karakiorgiou. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to thank Onassis Foundation and Delphi uh, Economic Forum for uh, giving us the opportunity to participate in this uh, exchange of ideas promoting growth and innovation. A hundred fifty years ago, the great visionary Jules Verne wrote in his novel, The Mystery Island, that the future uh, coal of the future will be water. And his vision became reality. Hydrogen is a rocket fuel. It is the fuel of choice for the space exploration. It is the fuel of the space shuttle. The necessary energy comes from the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen. So why not use it in shipping? Hydrogen is the most abundant and the lightest element in nature. It is non-toxic, non-polluting, non and travels upwards to mitigate uh, potential fires. No fire is good, but hydrogen fires are safer than gasoline fires. It has uh, a very low density of 70 kilograms, around 70 kilograms per cubic meters, which means that its uh, energy per unit volume is relatively low, and we need more st storage space for hydrogen, about three times more than LNG. It burns in internal combustion engines with minimal greenhouse gases because of the pilot fuel needed for its ignition. Also, in fuel cells, it produces clean electricity without noise and vibration. It is this atom, the hydrogen atom, is very low, and it penetrates the, meta the atomic structure of metals, making them more brittle and prone to fracture. So we have to be careful with the materials we use, we use with it. Hydrogen is an energy carrier. It's an energy carrier, and we need to put to put uh, energy on something to produce it. The largest percentage is from the reaction of steam with coal, natural gas, or biomass. And uh, the caveat here is that for every ton of hydrogen produced, we need 10 tons. We emit. 10 tons 
of carbon dioxide. Another way to produce it is via electrolysis, uh, which and the source of the electricity for it, which breaks the water to hydrogen and oxygen, is really characterizing uh, the rainbow color of uh, hydrogen. If it's from renewable sources, then we are dealing with green hydrogen. Unfortunately, green hydrogen is, is expensive, and our target is to go below, to take the cost below $1 per ton of, per kilogram of hydrogen. Biological processes also apply, very common in nature, but experimental in the laboratory. Hydrogen is stored in a liquid form at minus 253 degrees, which are uh, close to the absolute zero, very low temperature. In double tanks with vacuum insulation in between to prevent the evaporation of hydrogen. It can be also stored in uh, car uh, carbon fiber enforced uh, pressurized tanks in pressures between 200 and uh, uh, 700 atmospheres. Another way, as it was mentioned by previous speakers, is to uh, store it through ammonia or methanol uh, for easier transfer and storage. The most compact way to store hydrogen is in uh, metal hydrides. My metal hydrides can coerce uh, absorption or release of hydrogen. A more exotic way is in metal organic frameworks. These are the tinker toys of the chemists. What are MOFs? They are porous compounds that uh, consist of uh, metals connected with uh, organic ligands. They are characterized by very high surface area. One gram of an MOF might have surface area equal to a football field. Here you see the diesel cycle uh, phases of an internal combustion engine, dual fuel because of the, of the uh, pilot fuel, and uh, we can have a monofuel engine in case we utilize spark ignition as a combustion enhancer. In fuel cells, we have a process a reverse of what happens in electrolysis. Two electrodes, a catalyst to promote the reaction, and an electrolyzer in the form of a, a, perme a, a permeable membrane in which we have free flow of electron ions. In a, one electrode, uh, in the left electron here, uh, hydrogen uh, molecules are split in protons and electrons. On the other hand, protons, electrons, and oxygen recombine to get drinkable water. The electrons f uh, flow through a wire to their destination, creating electric current. We can put many fuel cells together to get a flexible, scalable, redundant, high efficiency electricity. A lot of times we combine fuel cells with batteries and batteries absorb the surplus electricity to utilize at peak demands. Up to today, initially we started with mock-ups. We went to coastal uh, vessels, smaller vessels with access to hydrogen uh, and uh, the shore. In order to upscale, we need to combine uh, high prob probably hybrid propulsion modes with internal combustion engines, fuel cells, and batteries. Ferries that run a very well uh, a determined a st a standard uh, uh, schedule and uh, have more frequent debunkering opportunities, they can rely solely on fuel cells. Uh, special requirements for hydrogen carriers. Uh, hydrogen fuel 
needs double, uh, double uh, wall uh, pipes like LNG. There are many similarities. And uh, the tank has pressure control through relief valves. We have about 0.3% uh, uh, per volume boil off of hydrogen, which should be either reliquified or uh, burned. And uh, we need to uh, maintain, monitor and maintain the vacuum of the tank. The hydrogen is the mother of all fuels. Why? Because it's the main feedstock for the synthetic fuels, ammonia, methanol, methane. It is the Swiss army knife of decarbonization. The cost which is today prohibitive needs to be reduced by maturing of the technology, upscaling, and technology enhancements like electrolysis of seawater, high temperature electrolysis, and carbon capture. Fuel cells are more effective than diesel engines. Building up the impacting uh, infrastructure of the nascent uh, hydrogen economy can start with the most frequent procedures. We need to establish and develop regulations for the use of hydrogen and also synergy and uh, cross-pollination of knowledge is also necessary. Hydrogen promises uh, a, fa a faster, cleaner, and more uh, and greener uh, environmentally friendly shipping. It is quite obvious that if the hydrogen utilized is sustainable, then uh, we are dealing with zero carbon emissions. And for that, we need to harness renewable sources of energy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, John. It was a very interesting and informative presentation on hydrogen. We'll now pass on the microphone to Manolis uh, Vergetis, who is a naval and mechanical engineer. He's a graduate of the National, National Technical University of Athens. He has served in various positions in the marine industry and has also gained extensive experience working for Lloyd's Register in the renewable energy sector. He currently holds the position of marine consultant in Intercargo. Manoli, thank you, sir. thank you. And thank you to the Foundation for the invitation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So in my presentation, I will present the methanol as a, a case of banker of the future. Initially, I would like to briefly set the scene of what we call uh, shipping decarbonization and to highlight uh, that the, the, the decarbonization in the shipping sector, it's a whole system challenge. It's not only about ships. The researchers have already estimated that the cumulative investment needs are approximately of one trillion US dollars and 90% of this investment will be to be on land on the various land-based infrastructures for production of low-carbon fuels. And the rest, 13%, is going to be needed for ships. Furthermore, regardless of the various fuel pathways, the future fuel costs will pose a significant proportion of the overall cost of um, operation for ships. The carbon abutment curve is extremely steep as we move towards 50% of the decarbonization targets and for shipping, at the very end of the curve, the decarbonization efforts will require investments that focus on the higher cost of technologies. Any developments uh, will also have a high reliance on governmental incentives and policies. And taking into account the, the nature of shipping, it is important that these policies are globally implemented. Also important to note that together with the other sectors, shipping will add additional stress in the renewable electricity production. And therefore, as an example, replacing the carbon intensive fuels we use today in ships and replacing them with either green methanol or uh, green ammonia, such will require an estimated of more than 5,000 
terawatt hours of energy, which is approximately equal to the 20% of the global energy production. In order to understand the, the maturity and the potential adoption of the future fuels, we need to take into consideration the various parameters. And starting from the right to the left, it is important that the technology readiness on board is mature and both OPEX and CAPEX are uh, uh, also looked seriously. The fuel storage, the safety requirements and the crew competence, of course. The global availability and the banking infrastructure and the safety restrictions for any fuel near urban areas and ports. The production methods and the infrastructure needs. And of course, the life cycle emissions of each new fuel, both in the downstream and in the upstream uh, sector. Uh, it is also important to note that the community readiness uh, is another important driver that needs to be uh, considered along with what the other sectors are doing. Shipping is not alone. Currently, methanol is a key product in the chemical industry. It's about 98 million tons of production per, per, per annum. And most of these quantities uh, are, used, uh, from, uh, are produced from fossil fuels. The production has nearly doubled, and this is mainly due to China. And uh, while methanol can be dangerous and toxic, if not carefully and safely handled, the very same theme can be said for the other alternative fuels, as well as the gasoline and diesel. And there is experience of more 40 years and more of the methanol in various uh, transportation sectors. Since 2015, with the launch of the Stena Germanica, it's Aeropax, methanol is already being used by over 20 ships, and it is currently the fourth most used marine fuel globally. As of March 2022, there are more than 30 vessels on order that are going to be dual fuel and they're going to be probably use methanol as fuel. And uh, earlier this year, more methanol compatible engines have been announced by the major OEMs, and class societies have also provided approvals for more designs. A significant milestone has been the order from Maersk of 12 uh, container vessels, a total order of more than 1.4 billion um, uh, US dollars, and the recent annou announcement again from Maersk of the supply deals to secure enough green methanol for these vessels. Uh, as it has been said, it, it is also important to note that methanol is an excellent hydrogen carrier and it is currently used in small applications in shipping with fuel cells. While, while we do see deep sea shipping vessels like tankers and containers on the water and on order, only early last month, the SDARI announced the uh, design uh, of a bulk carrier. Based on the latest study by TNO, most short sea and inland shipping markets appear feasible in terms of operational profiles, fuel consumption, and sailing patterns, but important to recognize that the ocean-going vessels make up only of 20% of the global shipping, but 80% of the bunkering requirements. More specifically, the dry bulk sector is one of the most difficult sectors to decarbonize due to the Trump trade, with around 12,000 uh, vessels, more than 300,000 uh, uh, shippers, and uh, calling at approximately 1,500 ports globally. Methanol today is attractive and competitive alternative from the point of view of fuel storage and banking infrastructure costs. As a fuel, methanol has been cost competitive with MGO and MDO, and it is also competitive when compared with emissions abatement technologies. The graph compares the global methanol pricing in key regions and the MGO versus methanol until 2019. Converting a vessel to methanol requires double the volume of the fuel tank capacity compared to diesel, and, uh, uh, but we don't need pressurized tanks, although there is a substantial uh, pilot fuel needed for methanol. It is not carbon free. On the safety issues, well-established international rules, there is experience, and also important to note that uh, with respect to uh, spills to aquatic environment for both methanol and ethanol, the, uh, they pose less threat to aquatic organisms than the current fuels used. It is expected that most of the 122 available methanol terminals globally can be used for bunkering. The safety procedure for handling of, the, of this fuel are quite well known, and the bunker suppliers seem to support uh, this fuel 
since it is, uh, it is easy to handle and uh, uh, minor, minor alternation to the existing infrastructure is expected. Now, in the production, as was said, 65% of methanol production is based on natural gas, while the rest, 35, is based on coal. Currently, only about 0.2% comes from renewable sources. There are several pathways to renewable methanol. In the uh, electrofuel pathway, renewable electricity is used to extract hydrogen from water, electrolysis, and uh, in the biomass pathway, the organic matter is pro processed from biomethanol. There are uh, more than 30 production sites that are going to be planned within the next years in order to produce uh, renewable meth methanol from uh, renewable feedstocks. A number of companies, it's also interesting to note, that are exploring the idea of carbon capture and storage. And uh, another important, I think, uh, uh, interesting thing about methanol is also that it can also be produced from municip municipal solid waste. So while grey methanol may provide CO2 savings of up to 15%, the renewable methanol can cut these emissions by 95%, but production comes with very high cost. And as shown in the table, you cannot see it, but it is extremely high, reaching of 800 USD dollars until 1600 USD dollars per tonne and going further on uh, if uh, uh, we talk about director capture. To sum up, I would say that uh, methanol can possibly support an efficient transition leading towards green methanol. The main barriers to the adoption of renewable methanol is the same as with the, all the other alternative fuels, ammonia, hydrogen, namely uh, this is the cost of production and the need for more renewable energy to scale up this production. Parallelly, a global life, life cycle emission standard for all fuels is fundamental to provide a stable environment for the industry and probably it also needs to be accompanied by a global level-based market-based measure that may assist the alternative fuels to be more competitive. And last but not least, of course, there are policies on land that need to be assist the scale up of all these uh, alternative fuels, including methanol. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Manoli, for a very nice uh, and concise presentation. We now pass the floor to George Plevrakis. George serves as an ABS Vice President for Global Sustainability. He's based in Athens. In his current position, He's leading five sustainability centers around the world, and he's responsible for helping ship owners and operators develop fuel and operational strategies to meet sustainability goals. George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like also to thank the organizers for this lovely event and also the foundation for the, uh, doing us the honor of uh, inviting us uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this open dialogue of um, uh, future options for the energy transition. Um, my topic is ammonia as fuel. It's a very uh, um, uh, frequently discussed topic, a very popular uh, fuel in the discussions, uh, and uh, it is considered as one of the end goals for uh, fueling the energy transition. It doesn't come without challenges, and we, are, we will attempt to highlight what are the benefits and the challenges of this fuel in this presentation. Normally, we start these presentations by creating the groundwork of the drivers. These drivers have been very uh, uh, extensively discussed during this uh, conference and with the previous speakers, so I'm not going to stick too much on that slide. But what I would like to emphasize is the fact that all the studies that have seen the light of day with regards to how our industry is going to meet its 2050 targets, the challenge for reducing 50% the global greenhouse gases compared to 2008 values, uh, all of them point to the fact that we need a carbon neutral or a zero carbon solution. I say carbon neutral and zero carbon because at the end of the day, um, the uh, overview of how the fuel is produced is going to be incorporated in our strategies. When we're talking about energy transition, we're talking about mainly two pillars. Energy transition is going to be based on two pillars, the carbon value chain, which is 
uh, not the central topic of this presentation, but it does have some elements that contribute into the production of ammonia, and I will explain that in the next slide, and of course the hydrogen value chain. The previous speakers have uh, explained how hydrogen pays, plays a very vital role in the energy transition and how it will actually support the production of uh, carbon neutral and zero carbon fuels. Among those fuels is ammonia. And as we will see later, ammonia is considered one of the most um, efficient uh, hydrogen carriers. We will see how this uh, will actually uh, happen in the next slides. So, what is ammonia? A very interesting comment that we normally get when we discuss about ammonia is the fact that ammonia has more hydrogen in its molecule than hydrogen itself. Um, it is uh, actually based on nitrogen and hydrogen. There is no carbon atom in the molecule. That's why it is considered a zero carbon fuel. It is very widely used in the, uh, uh, in the industry, for in the chemical industry and in the uh, fertilizer industry. And uh, 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 across the board, we know uh, how to manage and handle uh, ammonia in the different processes. It is a volatile uh, substance um, and it has low reactivity. That's a, both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because its low reactivity uh, reduces the risk of explosiveness and fire. However, this is the exact thing that you want when you are actually using it as a fuel. Every fuel needs to react in a combustion chamber and with ammonia there is a challenge. And we will discuss how this challenge is actually addressed in the uh, combustion technologies. We did say that it's a zero carbon fuel, but it comes also with the uh, drawback that it is toxic. It is toxic to humans. It creates, it irritates the eyes, the airways and the, and the lungs. And above a certain uh, uh, composition in the, in the air, it can be fatal. So this is a, a high risk that has to be addressed from a design perspective. It is also a, a very interesting hydrogen carrier and it can be produced through renewable energy sources and this is very critical to the discussion about ammonia. Mainly because currently ammonia is produced through fossil fuels, through the use of fossil fuels. A big portion of that is the steam methane reforming as we call it, a process that takes methane, it cracks it and it produces CO2 and hydrogen in the process. We take that hydrogen, we combine it with ni nitrogen from the atmosphere and through the Haber-Bosch process, as it's called, we produce ammonia. I did mention at the beginning of this description that you have CO2 produced. If you capture CO2, this is now the carbon capture link with the beginning of the presentation, you get what we call blue ammonia. And that reduces the overall emissions at the rate that you capture the CO2 on the production side. However, the end goal is to produce ammonia through renewable energy sources, uh, at the end, green ammonia. That can only happen if you actually use uh, renewable electricity through wind or solar, for example, utilize the uh, electricity that's produced in order to um, uh, run the electrolyzers that uh, previous speakers also uh, highlighted. And through the electrolysis, break the, the uh, uh, water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, again, combine hydrogen with nitrogen and get ammonia. This process, theoretically, is considered as uh, zero carbon, and therefore, green ammonia is the end game so that we can have ammonia that can actually contribute to the decarbonization initiatives from end, from uh, well to wake, as we call it. I have very frequently used the term well to wake, uh, production emissions, these all relate to the life cycle approach that we currently lack as far as the uh, regulations is concerned. Um, however, lately there have been a, a number of proposals submitted to the International Maritime Organization for consideration in order for the industry to have a framework to assess all those fuels from a well to wake perspective and identify which fuels are actually contributing less or more to the global emissions. Therefore, being able to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Because, as you will also see on this slide, depending on how you produce ammonia, 
ammonia might be zero carbon. It's not exactly zero. You will see 96% reduction there because there is this element of um, a, a, a requirement of having some sort of an ignition source. And at this point, the engine developments uh, require fossil fuel in order to uh, act as that ignition source. That contributes to the carbon footprint of ammonia from a life cycle perspective. However, even that is close to zero. If you produce ammonia, though, from fossil fuels, you will see that's even worse than the fuels that we are currently using as an industry. That's why we need a framework to assess that particular footprint and compares apple to apples and oranges to oranges. We did say that we are looking for the green molecule, the uh, renewable energy, in order to produce all these fuels. That's, again, um, scaling up uh, that particular um, uh, footprint is a challenge. If we want to cover the, the needs of our industry through renewable ammonia, green ammonia as we call it, then uh, the uh, uh, renewable energy sources as they are right now, they will have to scale up to uh, four to five times. If we want to include also the consumption from the other sectors, this scaling up will actually be a lot larger, up to seven to eight times the footprint of the renewable energy installation that we have currently uh, globally. If we achieve that though, and we are circling back to the first comment that I made at the beginning, ammonia is uh, the most efficient energy uh, hydrogen carrier uh, of the synthetic fuels that are going to be based on hydrogen, mainly because it will not require a carbon atom. And that carbon atom, including that into the process and creating uh, hydrogen-based uh, synthetic fuels with a carbon atom, is significantly expensive, it is costly, and also in, uh, uh, affects the efficiency of the whole process. Therefore, if we manage to scale up renewables, ammonia will be the uh, most efficient hydrogen carrier based on uh, the process. Where we are right now with ammonia or the other fuels is that on the IMO side with the carbon intensity indicator and the CII uh, regulation that is going to be part of our portfolio, uh, the regulatory portfolio next year, um, if we look at how that is actually addressing fuels, it's a, it addresses the fuels from a uh, uh, combustion perspective only, and therefore ammonia will actually uh, be uh, giving the vessel that is using the fuel a straight A throughout, throughout its lifetime. That is not considering the life cycle approach, it's also considering the combustion emissions. It doesn't come without challenges, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the biggest challenges is the toxicity. It is actually uh, the toxic nature of ammonia creates a toxic uh, 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 risk profile higher than the uh, other fuels that have been addressed. And that toxic nature should be addressed on the design of the vessel and have a risk-based approach both on the design as well as the operations. The other challenge that we have with, with ammonia is the energy content. The energy content in less, is less than the fuels that we are actually using uh, currently and uh, a vessel that will actually switch to ammonia will require almost three and a half, uh, a larger, three and a half times larger space to accommodate the same, uh, the same transport work compared to MGO, for example. How do we use it? We don't have um, engines, propulsion engines or generating sets at this point. However, the intention is and the, the development is that we're going to have them in place in a couple of years from now both on the propulsion side as well as on the power generation side. The strive is to reduce, at this point, the uh, uh, ignition source, the pilot fuel that we mentioned earlier, to, uh, to as low levels as possible so that we also have a reduction of the carbon footprint of the operation of ammonia as well. This is not a concern for fuel cells. Fuel cells are no, also in, under development in order to use uh, ammonia, particularly the solid oxide fuel cells family. It, uh, they are now uh, considering uh, utilizing ammonia. They are not combusting ammonia. It's a, uh, it's a, a, electro, a chemical electrical um, uh, process that happens in the fuel cells. However, it is immensely expensive currently and it will require also energy storage in order to compensate for the transient loans that you have on the vessels. 
Are we done with the emissions? No. And I'd like to raise the attention in two. When you're actually utilizing ammonia as a fuel in a combustion engine, you are producing NOx. You have the presence of nitrogen also in the fuel, and that will actually increase the NOx emissions. However, uh, ammonia will actually also increase the efficiency of the catalyst that we put after the engine, and therefore, this is something that we will be uh, able to abate relatively easily. The other thing that ha is not very much uh, dominant in the discussions of the industry is the fact that when you are actually uh, combusting ammonia and other fuels as well, you are producing laughing gas. Laughing gas is what you see now in the formula N2O. It is a significant, a very potential uh, greenhouse gas, uh, up to 265 times worse than CO2. However, if you can uh, tune the engine uh, uh, at, at certain points, then this, uh, the risk of having laughing gas escaping is also, can also be mitigated. It's also uh, up to the uh, uh, vessel uh, uh, technologies that we bring on board to mitigate this risk as well. So, to conclude, ammonia has the biggest advantage of being a zero carbon fuel. It doesn't have a carbon atom in its molecule. It can be stored relatively easier, uh, uh, more easily than other cryogenic fuels. It's mildly cryogenic, but it does not require the uh, infrastructure in place that you would require for uh, LNG, for example. Uh, it can be easily uh, produced through renewable energy sources, um, and uh, it can actually be also converted easily into uh, hydrogen in order to utilize it in other, uh, in other uh, energy conversion uh, devices. However, challenges. Um, let's start with the regulations. There, are, uh, there is a lack of guidance, uh, guidelines uh, in, uh, in various aspects of the operation related to ammonia. I will raise the example of the uh, bankery guidelines that are currently under development. We don't have also the life cycle approach so that we can assess how we actually produce ammonia, whether it is better or worse for the uh, environment. Um, it is corrosive and toxic, and that uh, the latter is uh, what the thing that raises uh, the risk profile of ammonia, and it has to be incorporated in the design and the operations when we are actually evaluating ammonia as fuel and doing the risk-based approach. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. I think we have some room for questions as well. Thank you very much, George. Before uh, opening uh, the floor to any questions that you might have, I wanted to summarize a little bit what we've just heard in terms of technology. And uh, as you've heard, LNG and methanol are already proven technologies which are being used today. And I'm talking using both fuels uh, in their fossil, um, for spice, for, uh, fossil fuel state. Uh, in terms of uh, moving uh, to ammonia, the first engines will be available in 2024, 2025, and we still don't know yet you know, if uh, anything uh, unusual uh, will, uh, will surface between now and then. Looking at hydrogen, we should look even further forward, probably five, ten years away, uh, before being able uh, to say confidently that we know how to harness the energy from hydrogen in a cheap and efficient way. One thing which is very, very common uh, in all the presentations is that if we start talking about producing green fuels, the major component of those is renewable energy. And we need to understand that we do not have enough renewable energy at the moment in order to replace the fossil fuels that we use in order to generate power for the land industry. If we take some of that away in order to produce transportation fuels, that will probably delay even further the decarbonization effort for the planet. Now, I would like, would, do we have any? Uh, we only have 10 seconds. So, uh, who has one question? Okay, go ahead. Thanks so much. My name is Alexander Znuskas. I would like to ask how far 
or close we could be in, uh, elect in electricity. Uh, perhaps not for ocean uh, going on transatlantic uh, uh, you know, ways, but perhaps with feeder vessels uh, for closer distance uh, trips, if anyone is aware of, of course. Thank you. If I understood correct, is if we could use electricity in order yeah. to propel vessels. Yeah. What about uh, storage within the vessel? And Who would like to say that? Okay. John. Electrification definitely is going to play uh, a major role in the decarbonization charge, but uh, uh, so far, and uh, it's quite obvious, uh, but the source of producing the electricity is really the key point. So, uh, like it was mentioned, the main idea is to harness the renewable sources of energy and uh, the main idea is not only the renewable sources, but also the water. To produce, for example, one ton of uh, hydrogen, you need nine cubic meters of water. So you also need water, you also need electrolyzers, and so on and so on. But uh, it has also a position there. It is definitely going to be part of the future. I totally agree. And one thing that you should remember, in order to have electrification, we will probably need batteries. And batteries are very costly to make, and we don't have the available raw materials in such quantities to produce the necessary quantities that we need. Well, I think this concludes this presentation, and we're looking forward to welcoming you to the next one.